This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. The Israeli military has announced it now believes 229 hostages are being held by Hamas and other militant groups in Gaza. The hostages were seized on October 7th, when Hamas carried out a shocking attack that Israel says killed about 1,400 people. Hamas has released four hostages so far. On Thursday, Hamas officials claimed the Israeli bombardment of Gaza has already killed 50 of the hostages, but the group did not provide any evidence to back up this claim. A Hamas official who's part of a delegation visiting Moscow says the group will not release any more hostages until Israel halts the airstrikes. Meanwhile, families of the hostages continue to call for their loved ones to be safely returned. This is Hadass Calderon in Tel Aviv. Five members of my family have been kidnapped. Five. My mom, my niece, two children, Erez Sar, and their father, Ofer. A, a week ago, I was announced, I got the information that my mom and my niece have been murdered. I didn't have time to grave and to go to the funeral. Today, a week after, I went up to the grave. So today I was crying and graving. <laughs> And now I'm, I'm celebrating, you know, this, it's a surrealistic situation. We are celebrating uh, my son, Erez, who's 12 years old, today. We're celebrating his birthday. Uh, he, he loves the mountain bike, and uh, uh, his father also is very professional in, in uh, riding bike. So uh, that's what you see, and I wish he could be here to enjoy with everybody and to feel like a normal boy. We're joined now in Jerusalem by Gershon Baskin. He is Middle East director of the International Communities Organization Human Rights Advocacy Group. In 2011, he helped negotiate the release of the Israeli soldier Gilad Shalit from Hamas captivity uh, after five years in exchange for the release of 1,027 Palestinian prisoners. His memoir is, ha is called In Pursuit of Peace in Israel and Palestine. Welcome back to Democracy Now!, Gershom Baskin. If you can say what you think needs to happen right now. What needs to happen is what Hamas spoke about already two weeks ago, which is a release of what they call the civilian hostages in exchange for an immediate ceasefire. That's what Hamas has been saying uh, since yesterday, and yesterday there was a change of tone from Musa Abu Marzouk, is the Hamas official who's who went to Moscow. Uh, I communicated with Dr. Musa Abu Marzouk yesterday, who for the first time said there needs to be a ceasefire first, and then we'll talk about the hostages. Right now, Hamas is holding women, children, elderly people, wounded and sick people, who it's obviously against uh, international humanitarian law to hold them, to abduct them, to kill them. It's also against Islam. It's against their own beliefs in the Quran to take women and children and elderly people as hostages. Uh, I think that uh, Israel is prepared to grant a ceasefire to stop the uh, uh, bombardment of Gaza uh, and to enable uh, uh, civilian hostages to come home. We have to be clear also who we're talking about, because for Hamas, every Israeli is a soldier. So it needs to be defined who they are talking about when they're talking about civilians. But there's a big complication here, because Hamas is probably not holding all the hostages. The Hamas political leadership, which is scattered between Gaza, Beirut, and Doha, is not in charge of the hostages, and it's not clear that when they make an obligation, say to the Qatari government that they are willing to negotiate some kind of deal, that they are actually able to implement the deal. Uh, there's a big question about it, of who is talking to the people who have control of the hostages, and whether or not Hamas at all has control of all the hostages, because some were taken by Islamic Jihad, some by PFLP, and some by individuals who are holding hostages. Talk about your back channels, Gershon, to Hamas, to Egypt, and to Qatar. I've been talking to everyone. I've been talking to Hamas people in Gaza, in Qatar, and in Beirut. Um, it's a very difficult conversation. In my assessment, today, three weeks into this war, is that they don't have a coherent strategy. They're not all giving the same messages. And as I said, I'm not sure that they even have control. The Qataris were 
talking quite a lot, wanted direct contact with the Israelis. Myself and a colleague who's in Rome put them in direct contact with the Israelis. It's not sure who they're talking to on the Israeli side and if the people they're talking to the Israeli side are actually sitting in the war cabinet making the decisions. It seems that the side with the best contact are the Egyptians. And the Egyptians were responsible for releasing the second two women who are Israelis without second passports. They're Israeli Israelis, members of kibbutz along the Gaza border. One of them has been a peace activist and a volunteer driver of sick Palestinian children from Gaza to Israeli hospitals for years. And it seems that they were released as a result of Egyptian pressure on El Qassam, on the military wing of Hamas. That was Yocheved uh, Lipschitz, who also spoke to the press after she was That's, released. Uh, her husband right. is still in, also well known as a peace activist who went to the border crossing repeatedly to help Palestinians and especially those who um, were having medical problems. That's right. So. <clears throat> How did the first two hostages get released? And do you see anything large happening now? So I think my, my understanding of what happened with the two sets of women who were released is that the first one was the result of direct pressure of President Biden and Secretary Blinken on the Qatari government, who applied pressure on the political leadership of Hamas, who is hosted in Qatar. And they and, and President Biden mentioned their names, specifically their American citizens who live in Chicago. I believe that the second set of the two women who were released was a result of the Egyptians wanting to show that they could do better than Qatar in releasing two elderly women who are full Israeli citizens without another uh, passport. The Israelis weren't involved in either releases at all. They had no part of it. And Israel didn't pay anything for those releases. I really think this is some kind of negotiating game and the competition that exists between Qatar and, um, and uh, Egypt. I think that the Israelis are holding off on the ground incursion of thousands of Israeli troops, tanks, and artillery, and special forces in order to exhaust every possibility to bring out as many hostages through negotiations. This seems to me the reason why the Israeli delay on the incursions. In the meantime, Israel is going in with small forces. Uh, for two nights now, they've done this to, uh, I think, assess the situation on the ground to take care of specific intelligence information they have about Hamas battle plans once the incursion begins, and probably with special forces to see if they can find any of the hostages. And how important is U.S. pressure on them to uh, to delay the invasion or to stop it altogether? And do you see the U.S. putting that kind of pressure? Originally, President Biden said he was not telling Netanyahu to use any kind of restraint. Right. So, so Israelis and, and others, Americans, have said that the Americans are encouraging Israel to wait and to exhaust every possibility for negotiations, to wait with the ground operation. I think it has been influential, but uh, there are more and more voices in Israel who are calling to the Israeli government to recognize their moral responsibility to the hostages, because the, the number one function and responsibility of any state is to protect its citizens. And Israel clearly failed to protect these civilians who live along the Gaza border uh, and, and enabled them to be murdered and to be taken hostage. So there are calls, significant calls from, from Israelis, not, not like me on, on the left, but from the center of Israel's society, from the national security establishment, who are saying that Israel first has a responsibility to bring home the hostages. There are even several of them, including a former head of the Mossad, who said that Israel should even empty out all of its prison prisons and send all the Palestinian prisoners to Gaza in exchange for all the hostages being released. I, I can't see that happening. But I think that there is more time, although not a lot, for a negotiated agreement for a release of the civilian hostages. I think it's important to note that the American government is and should be uh, placing pressure on Qatar. Qatar has been the host of the Hamas leadership for many years. It has funded Hamas with more than a billion dollars over the years. And Qatar, if it doesn't comply with American demands to put pressure on Hamas, Qatar should threaten the Hamas leadership that if they don't comply, if they don't pressure their own people back in Gaza, that they will be exiled from their welcome stay in in Qatar. And Qatar, is, by hosting Hamas, is in a way a state that's supporting terrorism. 
Uh, Gershon Baskin, I wanted to ask you about a number of the hostage families um, and families of those um, Israelis who Hamas killed on October 7th, like um, uh, Chaim Katzman. Uh, who was a University of Washington graduate student, came back to the kibbutz. Um, he was trying to protect others. He was in a closet, and he was killed. We spoke both to his Seattle rabbi, where he was a Hebrew school teacher uh, in Seattle, and his brother Noy, who is in Vienna, in Austria. Both called for an end to the occupation and said the invasion is not the answer to what has happened. Your final thoughts on what needs to happen now? Yeah, I, th I, I hope that after the Israeli people are experiencing the biggest trauma since the Holocaust and the Palestinians have been taken back to 1948 in the Nakba, that we wake up from this traumatic situation and understand first the Israelis that to delude ourselves that we can occupy another people for 56, 56 years and have peace is simply not real, or that we can lock 2 million people in an open-air prison for 17 years and expect to have quiet, is living in, a, in an imaginary world of, of delusion. I hope that the Palestinian people wake up and understand that they will never have peace if they don't recognize the Jewish people's right to live in the land of Israel as well as their right to live in the land of Palestine. And that when this ends, I call it the day after tomorrow, because tomorrow is too soon. But the day after tomorrow, I've been calling for what um, the metaphor I use is the Belfast moment, the moment when we stand up and say we've been killing each other for 100 years and we have to stop. Our leaders need to pay the price for bringing us here, Israeli leaders and Palestinian leaders. They all need to go. And we need a new generation of Israelis and Palestinians who are willing to stand up with new ideas, new visions, new hopes, new dreams, and the ability to lead us forward on the very basic principle that everyone living between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea must have the same right to the same rights. That is the basic principle from which we have to start. And from there, we can decide if we want one state, two states, three states, or 10 states, a federation or a confederation. But it begins with the mutual recognition that we all must have the same right to the same rights. Ershan Baskin is Middle East Director of the International Communities Organization, a human rights advocacy group. In 2011, he helped negotiate the release of the Israeli soldier Gilad Shalit from Hamas captivity in exchange for more than 1,000 Palestinian prisoners. His memoir is titled In Pursuit of Peace in Israel and Palestine.